The stone the builders rejected that has become the chief cornerstone. That's our Lord and our Savior. He's our strength when we are weak. Oh, precious Father, we lift our hands in gratitude. We lift our hands in thanksgiving. We lift our hands in praise. You have done us well. You have been faithful and true. You have not abandoned your own. You have stood by us when others abandoned us. We come tonight, precious Father, to appreciate you. You are truly God alone. Thank you for being the God of Kingsway Community Church. Thank you for being the God of every life and every family and every household bow before you tonight. Thank you for being God of the pastorate and the elders and the leaders of this place. Thank you for being God over our nation, our town, our city. Thank you for being God over the body of Christ. Thank you for being our God. Because of you we stand. Because of you we can face tomorrow. Through you we have gone through today. To this point we are grateful. We will finish strong with you by our side. Oh, precious loving Father, we bow. Holy Spirit, teach us. Speak to us, instruct us, mold us, renew us. Ah, Papa, I just love you for being you. Thank you. Let everybody here who is weak, spiritually, physically, mentally, emotionally, financially, whatever early way, be made strong as we sit in your presence. 
Oh, let joy be released like a river in your presence tonight. Let there be a fresh baptism of your Holy Ghost and power in each life here tonight. Let there be a renewal of strength, my Father and my God, because in your presence the weak are made strong. Let those of us who struggle to understand Scripture, let our eyes be opened in your presence the blind see. Come Holy Spirit, come and take your place. Come Lord Jesus, be our Rabboni. Heavenly Father, we are here for you. Have your way, blessed Trinity. We worship, we pray, and we praise with thanksgiving through Jesus Christ our Lord. And God's children said, Amen. Amen. Good evening all in Jesus' name. Please be seated. Amen. Good evening. And how are we tonight? Very well. Good. Thank you. Yes. Yes, sir. Much. <laughs> much to be Every time, much to be thankful for. Amen. It's good to see smiles and faces because the sun arose. Everybody seems happy. I like that scripture that says, see Habakkuk, Hosea, away. That the son of righteousness shall arise over us with healing in his wings. So there's a son that also arises that brings greater joy than the son we see outside. Amen. So each day, let the son of righteousness rise over you. Amen. Yes, sir. Sorry, Pastor, can I just interrupt you? Because we're starting off in joyous laughter and having fun, on the way in, there was a lady using the car park, and I, as she was walking out, I said, oh, you know, you come into church. What? <laughs> so I said, well, yeah, come to church, have some fun. And she looked at me, she said, fun in church? <laughs> And I said, yeah, we have fun. We laugh while we're praying. Oh, you know, wow. It was such an eye-opener of people's attitude that church is a dim, miserable place to be where you've got to be holier than thou all the time. All right, so I'm setting all of you children of God, sons and daughters, a challenge. Go into the world and be happy. When they ask you, why are you happy? Say, oh, myself and daddy were talking. Yourself and daddy, but you're alone. Oh, I'm mean, talking about daddy God. Daddy God has a sense of humor. He's fun. Begin to let the fun of God in you rub off on others. We said on Sunday, the joy of the Lord. So people must see the joy of the Lord in you. Jesus is not coming again. When he comes again, he's not coming as a babe in a manger. He's not coming to walk on the road and heal the blind and raise the dead. He's coming as a judge. So we need to let them know the joy of the Lord now so that by the time he comes, everybody we know is ready. How many people do each of us know, sir? On average, how many people can we influence, come in contact with, speak to? 80,000, 8,000, 8 million? <laughs> I think in your lifetime is about at least 20,000. At least 20,000. Each of us. That's for the natural choice. human beings. But those of us who are supernatural because the spirit dwells in us, it's more than 20,000. <laughs> so leave your imprint everywhere you go. I was reading something recently. Um, I think John G. Lake. He went to pray for somebody with a tumor. And he got there and just put his hand and prayed and went. Only for the person to send him a message and say, That place you placed your hand. When you left, the imprint of your hand was still there, and that tumor melted into nothingness. That's the same God. It's not a different God, though. That was only 1904, 1906. It's not so far away. That was much after Jesus had come and gone. It's the same God we are serving. So I said, God, help me to leave your imprint everywhere I go. And that's what we need to do. Listen, I don't know about you, but I really don't like Bible study if we are not going to implement what we are studying. I feel it's a waste of time. And if you don't implement what you study, then what you study on the day of judgment stands against you because God will tell you, but you knew. I taught you. We invited Jesus to come tonight as Rabboni. And we said, Rabboni, teacher, come and teach us. So I may sit here, pastor may sit here, but really we're not the ones teaching you anything. What really can we teach if God hasn't taught us? So at the end of the day, we are just his voice on earth. It is Christ in us speaking to each one of us. So let's not just attend Bible studies to tick a box, but let's attend Bible studies to make a difference in our lifetime wherever God sends us. Amen? So tonight we are continuing with engaging God. Those who dare to engage God. And so far we've looked at one and a half. <laughs> I, 
was the one person we looked at. No, I said we've looked at one and a half. Who was the one? Peter. Peter, thank you, sir. And who is the half? Abraham. Abraham, because we didn't finish Abraham. <laughs> so we've looked at Peter and we've looked at half of Abraham. Amen. Anybody wants to give us a recap because Pastor wasn't here? <laughs> Just so I know. <laughs> week I had to go to London for ear nose and throat mm. at a day trip and the guy looked at me and he said your perforations have healed I said oh, oh wow I said we did engage in God in our Bible study <laughs> last night I said I'm a Christian and we both laugh but you say how you say I mean I use it on Facebook you know you don't necessarily talk to everybody about God in the course of the day but there's always some that I can't go tonight because I'm at church mm. but it was amazing to be able to tell this doctor um, about the Bible study, and all he was doing is looking in my ears. <laughs> so praise God, yeah. <laughs> Amen. You see what happens when you engage God, because God hasn't changed. He who has begun the good work shall perfect it. That's our God. Sometimes you're engaging God is just showing up. Just show up. You just show up and God takes over. Just show up. Be where God is. Amen. Thank you, man. God bless you. I love that testimony. I love testimonies, anyhow. So thank you very much. I love to discuss what God has done. I think Elder Murray said we should look at all the three sixteens in the Bible. And um, please help me. I think it's um, Malachi 3.16. I hope it's the correct one. So is it the correct one? That's the one. Then those who fear the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord listened and heard them. That's why I love talking about God. I don't like unnecessary conversation. When I was small, mommy and daddy had this little plaque on the world, on the wall. Um, yes, Jesus, the silent listener to every conversation. <laughs> so as a child, you're not sure if it's something to be happy about or something that should scare you. <laughs> Because any conversation you're having, good, bad, or ugly, there is a silent listener. So I want when the Lord is listening to me, what he hears gives him joy. And so based on that, he can open a book of remembrance and say, Chenyeze discussed me on this day. This is what she said. She discussed me with Auntie Jew. This is what they said. She discussed me with Pastor. This is what she said. She discussed me with Shalom. It doesn't matter who you are, big, small, or otherwise. Let's just discuss God. Amen. He listens. So talk about God. It makes him happy. And he writes it down. You see, it's not just we. We said on Sunday when we establish an altar, have a notebook, write it down. We are not the only ones who write. When we discuss God, God writes it down in his book of remembrance. So he doesn't forget. Amen. We are only emulating God. Yes, sir. Let's just to say that God keeps attendance of those who come to Bible study. Uh, he opens a book of remembrance. Um, so it's not for the pastor to, to chase, chase you up, but let's open ourselves up to listening to him and hearing from him. And it's a book of remembrance for what was written before him, for those who fear the Lord and who meditate. So just thinking about God, even your thoughts he records. Hallelujah. So think, think godly thoughts. <laughs> because sometimes you may not, sometimes, have you heard the story of the, the one who went to watch, um, it wasn't Asna he was watching. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, he was watching a team and they weren't doing very well. So he, he, he he's. <laughs> <laughs> so um, um, As Asna does well. We, we, God helps us. Uh, so th this, this, he was standing and they were trying to get him to sit down. And um, he was still standing up in the stands and all that. And his, his boss said, look, sit down. And then he sat down and he said, inside, I'm standing up. <laughs> so they may not know what you're doing, your thoughts, your inner thoughts. God knows. So people may not pick you up on what you're thinking, but God is listening even to our thoughts. So think good thoughts. Think 
kind thoughts, think helpful thoughts. I think that the, the thinking syllabus is the Philippians 4, verse 8. Philippians 4 and verse 8. Am I Pamela? Okay. Thank you. Sorry, sorry. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of a good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Okay, so let's meditate on the word of God. Because I think it's a good report. <laughs> Amen? Amen. What did we say of, about Abraham? Are you okay, sweetheart? Okay, God renew your strength in Jesus' name. Amen. What did we say about Abraham last week? Anybody? He was hospitable to the men of God passing by. He was hospitable to the man of God casually passing by. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Not you. Okay. Yes, anybody else? Oh, hallelujah. God's friend. Yes, Auntie Ju. Um, uh -huh. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so we're talking about Abraham. Ah. <laughs> uh, uh, um. Uh, we say that um, Abraham, he didn't just accommodate, he didn't just um, entertain, welcome, um, be hospitable to the people that came. Um, he also accompanied them. So he went above and beyond, you know, what was expected of him. Mm. And I, I only just laugh because... Um, you know, I you, you spoke about um, people when, you know, you have visitors, you stand at the door and you wave. And I love to stand at my door and I wave and say, okay, see you, auntie, see you next week. And whoever it is that comes to my door. But, you know, I learned that, you know, I need to go a step further because it could be that the Lord has sent that person to my house with a million pounds and the person <laughs> is not going to give it to me unless I walk with them to the car. So on the F1, next time you come, I will walk with you to your car. <laughs> you remind me of something that happened to the children many years ago. I think it was their first trip back home. So I said to them, listen, when you get home, be nice and be hospitable because it's expected that younger people should serve the older. Don't wait for somebody to say to you, uh -uh, haven't you seen me? See them before they see you. Welcome them. And I just gave them all that little pep talk. And I said that you'll be shocked that sometimes just doing that for somebody out of nowhere, they would bless you. So we went on holiday. And then we were in grandpa's house. And then grandpa gets visitors. And elder, little elder gets very busy. And she serves them, and she looks after them, and she clears the table. And when they were going, she had never met them before. She walks with them to the car to say bye-bye. She's saying bye-bye. And the gentleman says to her, come, my dear. He went to his car. He opened his boots, and he brought out wads of money. And he gave her that. And she looked at this. You know, when you go to bank, and they've done it all in the nice rolls, maybe in thousands or fives or tens, whatever was in that that one, <laughs> he gave all to Eldad, who was how old? Seven or nine. All. Eldad looked at it. I wasn't there. She came screaming, yelling, mommy, mommy, mommy. I said, what is it? She said, look at what the man gave me. I said, what man? She said, the man that came to visit grandpa, he's outside. So I came to see the grandpa's visitor going. Because she escorted them to the car. So it may sound like a joke that she's saying somebody may come to see me with a million dollars or a million pounds. If I don't escort, they may not give me. It's a possibility. You never know what is in those few steps. But be willing to take those few steps. Even if you get nothing. Don't do it because you're expecting a million pounds. Don't do it because you're expecting anything. Even if you get nothing, do it out of love, honor, and respect. 
That was, Abraham wasn't expecting anything. He was just doing the honorable thing, what he knew to do. And that's the blessing that came. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Well, the, one of the other things we learned last week was that God was not in a hurry to carry out the judgment that he declared upon Sodom and Gomorrah. Because the, the, the angels stopped, they spoke to Abraham and Sarah and said, told them about the baby. They cooked a meal, which couldn't have been cooked <laughs> in five minutes, all before they went off to carry out the judgment. God's not in a hurry to carry out judgment. He gives time for things right. In the same vein, thank you, ma. Don't be in a hurry to judge yourself. Don't be in a hurry to condemn those around you who have done wrong. I was having a conversation recently with God and just saying, God, you've been good to me. You know, when I misbehave, you don't turn your back on me. You don't look at me like I'm filth. You don't write me off. You don't walk. You've been good to me. Grant me grace to treat other people the way you have treated me. Because sometimes we're in a hurry. Okay, maybe not we. I am in a hurry to write. I really don't like sin, personally. I don't like anything. I don't like the devil. Full stop. I don't like anything to do with the devil. I don't want to have conversation with him. I don't want to see him. I don't want to smell him. I don't like him. I don't like anything he has to offer. So when I walk around people who seem to be having a lot of fun with the enemy, I really don't want to spend time around you. If I say to you what you're doing is wrong and you're not ready to change, I'm really not ready to hang around there. And that is what led me to my conversation with God. And I said, but God, you did it. if you had treated me that way, I will probably not be your child now. Somehow you came to me in the midst of that filth where I was and you reached out your hand and you brought me. Grant me the grace to be patient with other people. But you know... I don't like the devil. And you know I don't like sin. So don't put me in a place where I will be out with sin for too long. But grant me patience <laughs> to pray people out or love people out or guide people out. That is why me, I tell Paul about God. Because the honest truth is that the devil has nothing to offer you. So our Bible study is not about knowing about the devil. You don't need to know anything about the devil to be quite honest with you. If you engage God and you know God and you walk with God, the devil can come nigh you. He can't hurt you or your family because you take a stand where there is no room for him to come. I was sleeping the other night and suddenly it sounded like many footsteps walking into my house. I said, middle of the night, one day, who is visiting me at this hour? I said, Jesus, and I tried to say it, Jesus, and I couldn't even speak. I said, Lord, my voice. I said, in the spirit, if my mouth won't open, spirit, you will shout it. And in my spirit man, while I was struggling, I shouted, Jesus. And in my spirit realm on the bed, I saw myself spinning around on my bed, just shouting, Jesus. I said, every rubbish walking into my house, walk out in the name of Jesus. And suddenly my house was quiet. That's, they were walking in and going to my kitchen to eat. I said, how dare you? Then I woke up in the morning, and I just want to say this. Engage God, not people. I woke up in the morning taking the young man to school and discovered somebody had given me a gift. And I said to myself, I will just put it by the door. Later, I will sort it out. I didn't sort it out. Whatever I left by the door opened my door for strangers to enter. People, there's a spiritual realm and there's a physical. I took the young man to school. I came back and I destroyed that thing and threw it away. Nobody has come to visit me without permission. <laughs> because there's a physical realm and there's a spiritual realm. And as children of God, you are first of all physical beings. You are spiritual beings. Thank you, sir. You are spirits in a body. So when God, Jesus says, I am going, he didn't say, I will go and send you another flesh. He said, I will send you my spirit. So that your spirit man will know how to walk in the ways of God. That is why we are looking at these Bible studies and saying, engage God. If Abraham was dealing with God on a physical, physical level, he would not invite them to his house. Why? They are strangers. Shalom, did your mommy tell you strangers are your best friends? Mm -mm. What did she tell you? Auntie Mike. What did she tell you about strangers? Don't talk to strangers. Thank you. So if we are walking on a physical level, Abraham had no business talking to strangers. 
But something in his spirit man said to him, invite them in. Each one of us has a spirit. And we may not know yet how to engage the spirit of God, but God gives us a conscience. So what is that little inner voice saying to you to do? Obey that voice first. That is how to engage God. I was reading Smith Wigglesworth. He said, when he sits down, he was engaging God, people. Oh, you know, all these old people we read that. No, I won't say old, but all these <laughs> senior citizens we read about, they took time to engage God. That's why we read and talk about them. He would sit down. Ah, and he will wait, and the spirit will say to him, I want to talk to you. He will get up from where he is and go and silence himself somewhere. To listen to the word. Till he began to, when the spirit is not talking, he began to draw the spirit to talk. And people will say to him, how come? It takes, it's not a difficulty for you and God to converse. He said, because if God is not talking, I will make God talk. Can you make God talk? Can you engage God in a conversation because there is something on your mind? Or do you have to wait every time and wait for God to talk first? Sometimes you engage God. God should be your friend. Can you tickle God and make him laugh? Can you engage God? That's what we are talking about. This Bible study, honestly, is not about Peter, it's not about Abraham, it's about you, it's about myself. We must engage God. We must hold to God. It doesn't matter your age. Engage God on a daily basis, in everyday life. Grandma Pamela said, casually. And when they began to engage God, I love the fact that you reminded us God was not in a hurry. When you engage God, he will stop for you. Hallelujah, sir. When you engage God, he's never in a hurry. The people thought Jesus was in a hurry. So when the children came and they said, bless us, bless us, they said, shh, shh, Jesus is busy, he's busy. Have to. Jesus said, don't ever do that. Find me that scripture, Matthew something, something. Suffer the little children to come unto me. Bring them. Bring them. Don't keep your children away from God. Bring them, let them sleep here. Come with mats. When the children were much younger, we used to attend Festival of Life in London. You go there and take your mat, take your duvet. When they get sleepy, you lie them around at the edge. Let them sleep. But they are sleeping in the house of God. They are sleeping in the presence of God. While the Lord is passing by, where they are sleeping, they will get their own blessing and their own anointing and healing. It says, Jesus said, thank you very much, Matthew 19, 14. Let the little children come to me and do not forbid. Please help me, somebody. What does forbid mean? Do not stop them. Encourage them. Dare I say tonight, from Elder Morris to little Shalom, each one of us are little children, is little children. And God is saying to you tonight, I don't forbid you from coming to me. I will never stop you from coming to me. I'm encouraging you, God is saying to each one of us tonight, I'm encouraging you, come to me. Come. Come the way you are. Come, just come. Whatever time of day or night you want to come to me, come. You don't need an appointment, the Lord is saying. Forbid them not. The kingdom of heaven is about you. The song says you didn't want heaven alone. So you, so you brought heaven down. The kingdom of heaven is about you. Jesus did not die to be lonely. He did not die to be an only son or an only child. He died so that both of us could have conversation. So that you and he could sit down together and talk. So that you could play together. What's the role of siblings? To play. Judah is not to fight, it's to play. The role of siblings, true or false, is to play. My brother, my friend, are you there? What's the role of siblings? 
What is your role? Tell me in your family. With your sisters, what's your role? Who has the mic? You, right? <laughs> okay, give your elder sister. Let her tell me what her role is as a sibling. While she's answering, you'll be thinking, I'll come back to you. I will come to you, say second, sir. Just a second, sir. Yes, please. I'd say my role is to keep my younger siblings in check and make sure they're happy. Wow. She has spoken like a real firstborn. <laughs> Look after my younger ones and make them happy. That's what Jesus is saying. Come. My role as your big brother is to look after you and to make you happy so engage me whatever is upsetting you talk to me about it i will make you happy so matthew eleven twenty eight, our father said to us matthew eleven twenty eight. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come to Auntie Chairs. <laughs> <laughs> me is the Lord. Come to me. Who, Pastor? Who? All. All. all we are all. The work of the elder sibling is to look after the younger ones and make them happy. Jesus says, come, I will take that weight off your shoulder. I will take that burden off your mind. I will take that pain out of your body. I will make you happy. I will give you rest. Come and engage with me. That's what Jesus did with Abraham last week. Abraham must have been sitting in front of that, his tent, counting the sand. Because it was a hot day. Ah, these my descendants, when will they come? Hmm. Counting the sun, encouraging himself. And that day, Jesus came and gave him rest. He said, you have, you see, Abraham had waited year one, year two. This time, Jesus put a time frame. That's how you have rest. Jesus says, according to the time of life. So Abraham could now begin to count and say, okay, okay. Hey, time of life, he had Isaac. That's how God gives rest. He tells you, okay, you have waited thus long. You know what? In the next two days. Some time ago, we came and we prayed and I cried. I said, church, pray for me. At the end of the prayer meeting, uncle said to me, the 24-hour miracle. I haven't forgotten that thing. I said, wow, God. So I have held him many times from then till now for my 24-hour miracle. And I have had so many 24-hour miracles come, and I'm still holding him for 24-hour miracles. <laughs> People, God's plan is to give us rest. It's not for, to give us torment. It's to give us an answer of peace. Our sister got an answer of peace last week. That's God's plan for you. You know, I was just reflecting that eternal life is not when we get to heaven. Eternal life starts now, here and now. And what's eternal life? Eternal life is the life of God in us. Christ in us, the hope of glory, <laughs> here and now. You know, we sing the song, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that would be when we all see Jesus will sing and shout the victory. No, but it's here. Heaven is in my heart here and now. This is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it now, don't postpone your joy till when you get to heaven. 
Don't postpone your good life till when you get to heaven. You know what? When we all get to heaven, we'll end up coming back here. Have you read that in the scripture? The new Jerusalem, the new heaven, and it will come back. We all come back to earth because God has given the earth to man. So let's engage God for the present. Lord, what are you saying now? How can you help me now, today? Hebrews 11, I think verse 1. Hebrews 11 verse 1 says, now faith. What is faith? No. Now? What is faith? Trust in God. When? Now. Faith is for now, not for the future. Faith is for today, for the present. And actually, the present is a present filled with presents. And presents. God is calling us to engage with him now and see the move of God today. I have read of Abraham, Moses, Gideon. God's not dead. He's alive. God's not dead. No. He's alive. God's not dead. He's alive. I can feel him all over me. Today, here and now, that's what we are talking about. Engage God today. You don't need to be in church to engage God. You don't need to be in a crowd of people. Just you. God is interested in the conversation you want to have with him. Now, all the questions on your mind, God, sit down. Put a chair in front of you and say, Okay, God, let's talk. Why did you, and sometimes, I, <laughs> why did you make the earth? Why did you make, I, I, I started to engage God on an intellectual level first because I like to reason, I, I'm a researcher, I like to ask questions. I, I'm asking, I want to understand. So I ask the questions. And God has never told me, well, just accept it by faith. No, no, no. <laughs> he gives me reason, rational things I can understand. And until he gives me the answer, I will keep asking. God will not be uh, overwhelmed by your questions. God will not feel insulted or perturbed by your questions. Ask him so that you, even if no one else is asking, I just want to... If you say, why, why are you asking? Because I want to know. I, I want to know. If no other person is interested in knowing, I want to know. Lord, tell me. And if you look at Moses, Abraham, those people, they treated God like a personal God. They didn't treat him as a communal general, <laughs> the God of England, <laughs> the God of Britain. No, this is my God. What are you saying to me? How would you help my situation now? I'm cooking a pot of rice or a pot of uh, jerk chicken. What should I? Um, okay, I'm making <laughs> stew or soup or something. Oh, oh. Tells you how, 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 how. how oh. Yes, okay, jerk chicken. Or, 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 or I'm, I'm playing football. Lord, how do I solve maths? How? I, I needed to know, engage him. I started to engage God as my teacher to help me understand maths, to help me understand science. Lord, explain this problem to me, just me and God in my bedroom. And that then translated to other aspects of life. So I asked God about anything. And he is willing to do the same for each one of us. God is no respecter of persons. He doesn't treat the Pope better than he treats any one of us. He is no respecter of persons. If you engage him, if you dare to engage him, if you dare to ask him questions, he will answer you. Okay, let's look at Abraham who dared to ask him questions. So we'll continue from paragraph 2 on page 167. Page 167, paragraph 2. Um, 
Those at home, where would they find it? Kingswayharich.org website. Amen. So please, listen. <laughs> go and download your own and join us. Amen. Abraham continued to engage God as he bargained with God over his plan to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah until he brought down the number of righteous people there to ten for whose sake God should not destroy the city. It is clear from the Holy Scriptures that if Abraham had gone down as far as requesting for one righteous man, he would have committed God to agree not to destroy the city because what God said is... So I sought for a man among them who would make a wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land mm. that I should not destroy it, but I found no one. Wow. God would have spared the place, but as Abraham stopped at 10, the instruction to the angels was that when they get there, they should look for 10 righteous people. But if they do not find, they should go ahead and destroy the city. But in his discussion with God, Abraham had said, Far be it from you to do such a thing as this, to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous should be as the wicked. Far be it from you. Shall you not judge, not the judge of all the earth do right? Mm. It means that if it happens that God does not find as many as 10 righteous people in the city as to spare the whole place, then he will not destroy the city until he has removed even one righteous man that he finds there. Come to think about this. It was a man like me, a man like you, who engaged God to such a level of commitment. So, when God was sending those angels, he must have instructed them if they get there and they do not find 10 righteous people, but they find a man, they should get him out of the place before destroying it. When they got to Sodom, they found only four righteous people. The angel said to Lot, Well, we cannot do anything until you are out of this place. It was Abraham that made it possible for them to do anything. It was Abraham that made it impossible, thank you, for them to do anything. It was significant to note that the following day, Abraham went and stood where he stood with the Lord the previous day. And Abraham went early in the morning to the place where he had stood before the Lord. Then he looked toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the plain. And he saw, and behold, the smoke of the land which went up like the smoke of a furnace. And it came to pass, when God destroyed the cities of the plain, that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in which Lot had dwelt. Abraham seems to have said, Lord, it was at this point you committed yourself to me yesterday. As I am seeing the smoke of Sodom, it looks as if you did not find 10 people there. But I hope you have rescued my nephew Lot and his family. That day, the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, but he remembered Abraham and delivered Lot. What made that to happen was because Abraham engaged God and he experienced God. The God I am talking about can be engaged by a man and unless we boldly begin to engage him, we will not experience his power. Let us discuss. <laughs> hmm. Who is bold enough to go first? Yes, sir. There's more to follow. We'll never, never exhaust the power of the Lord or his willingness to convey, converse with us. Amen. New. Amen. You will never exhaust, yes, sir, the power of God or his willingness to continue with us. So have you believed? You, uh, before, before you can talk about exhausting the power of God, you should have believed God enough to go and tap off the power. You cannot exhaust what you have not even started using. So our father started by saying, have you believed God enough? Just try where you are. 
Don't look for very big things. Just try where you are. Yes, sir. Um, every limitation we have of God is in our own mind. <laughs> what God cannot do does not exist. It seemed to me that Abraham was trying to do God a favor by saying, you've come all this way to do something. At least if I can get 10, that's fine. But it's with us too. <laughs> um, we believe God to save our colleagues and say, even if it's just one of them, or even if it's, even if it's a family member, why not all of them? <laughs> Why not believe God for every one of them? And because we believe, we have that faith that you were talking about, Pastor, earlier. Because of that faith that is now, God will do it if we have faith as small as a mustard seed. Our limitations are self-imposed. God will only work for you to the extent that you believe he can. It's not the extent of his power. It's a, the extent of our willingness to let him. The more we believe that God can, the more he does. Not because he can do less, but it's just because he's, he's, he's like a British gentleman. He, he, he waits to be asked and he doesn't um, go beyond the boundaries of decency and the limits of civility and the, the, the constraints you place. If you say to him, sit there, he will sit there. God doesn't violate our self-will. He allows us to engage him to the extent that we are willing to accommodate. Abraham stopped at 10. If Abraham had gone down to 1, God would have carried on to 1. God wasn't in a hurry to destroy the place. He, did, he, didn't, he didn't want to destroy the place in the first place. That's why he, he came, came down. down to discuss with Abraham, who he knew was compassionate enough to intercede. If he wanted to destroy the place, he would, have, he would have sent fire from heaven. He didn't need to come and discuss with Abraham. And God has not changed. He still does not want to destroy anyone. Family members who are unsaved or neighbors and colleagues, he still doesn't want to destroy. That's why Jesus had to come down. God could have why He told Moses, move. Let me wipe out everybody. God could have wiped out all of us long ago in our sin. But he gives him no pleasure. Hmm. Have you seen a child build their Lego bricks and then you come and kick it down? <laughs> <laughs> No, no, no. <laughs> that child will laugh at you. What they have built might actually be absolutely nonsense. But that is the work of their hands. That is their time and their labor of love. You are the work of God's hands. You are his time and his labor of love. There is no pleasure in knocking you down. There is no joy in destroying your life. So till tomorrow, Jesus is still walking. Some of us are the Jesuses that God is sending into people's lives. And I like what you said. Because looking at Peter and looking at Abraham, Peter engaged God for himself. Abraham engaged God for a nation. Who do you engage God for? On the Spirit's guidance to guide us in these things. I like that verse, I'll just, a part of a hymn Spirit of God, thou teacher be, revealing the things of Christ to me. Amen. What he wants us to do. Amen. As you ask that question, you know, um, who are we engaging God for? You know, I um, remembered, I, you know, listened to something this morning where it's about praying. And um, he was, this man, he was saying, he used to pray the comfort prayer, the easy prayers. Um, but then he realized that those prayers 
weren't having an effect no. on, it was just having an effect on himself, not anybody else. So he was not making a positive contribution to society. So all the problems were still in his neighborhood, still in his family, still happening around the world and so on, until he began to pray on behalf of other people. And, and so um, we have to, <laughs> and so uh, we, are, we are called um, like Abraham, um, not to just intercede for ourselves, but to intercede on behalf of other people. Because when we do intercede, uh, you know, um, it does make a difference. Sometimes it doesn't look like, you know, the prayers being answered. But some, we, we will never know, you know, until when we get to heaven. Yes, ma'am. We'll come to you after him. Yes, ma'am. When we make requests of God and he promises to do something for us, he doesn't forget. <laughs> it says here, he remembered Abraham. And then it reminded me about Hannah. He remembered <laughs> Hannah. So if God promises to do something for us, he won't forget. He'll do it. Amen. Our God is a God of, yes, ma'am. Remembrance, yes, ma'am. Um, it says, Eli and Abraham went early in the morning to the place where he had stood before the Lord. So what I learned from this is when you have spent time with God or when you have prayed, wait for an answer. Ah. Mm. That's the place of the altar. Where did you have a conversation with God before? Go back. You said sometimes when you talk with God, it looks as if God has not answered. To Abraham when he came, it looked like God had not answered because he saw smoke, meaning the nation was destroyed. But he did not know his nephew and family had been brought out. But God remembered the conversation they had. <laughs> ah, Kabutande. Yes, sir. Oh, so, help us, Lord. Yes, sir. <clears throat> so I've, I've just been looking up something I was reminded of. If you look at Ezekiel 33, 11, <laughs> it actually says there, God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked, rather that they turn from their ways and live. Amen. Thank you. I was thinking of that scripture. God bless you. Say to them, as I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Now see the heart cry of God. Turn. Turn. Turn from your evil ways. Why should you die? I remember sometimes telling the children, do I really need to flog you? Is my energy, is my, do I really need to? Why would you make me just do what is right? That's more or less what God is saying here. Do you, why do you want to die? Why do you want to spend time with the devil who has nothing to offer you? Why are you arguing with me? What I've said to you is for your own good. Just turn and do it. God hasn't changed, church. You may forget your prayer with God, but God hasn't forgotten. You may forget the requests you made. God hasn't forgotten. There are times I have prayed and I have forgotten my prayer until the prayer is answered. Then God reminds you of when both of you had that conversation. Because like Grandma Pamela said to us, God remembers. Put your name there. God remembered Shalom. God remembered Grandma Lorraine. God remembered Uncle Douglas. God remembered Uncle Monty. Put your name. God remembered. God will remember you. You're not wasting time engaging God. Yes, sir. Uh, two, two things uh, struck me there. The first was that Abraham went and stood where he stood with the Lord. Stand 
and keep standing until duty God post. does it. Stand at your duty post. Stand in faith. Even if you die in faith, keep standing. Because God will honor your faith. Uh, I think it's Habakkuk. He says, I will stand. I think Habakkuk 2, I think probably that's 1. I will stand on my watch to see what the Lord will say to me. These were the people who walked with God. They stood where they had the contract with God. And sometimes I remind myself, when I was about to get married, I said, Lord, is this the right decision? After fasting for like Ever. a while. And I was trembling. Should I ask Good her, what if she says no? Yeah. Good things are hard to come by. <laughs> and then he said to me, go ahead. I still remember that very clearly to this day. Go ahead. Just two words. And I have carried on holding on to him ever since. When God gives you a word, it becomes a standard under which you stand. Mm. When God gives you a word, it's a banner you are flying and you are saying, God, you told me to stand here. I am still here. He will not forget you. So Abraham stood on the word of God. And God is saying to us, standing on the promises of my, my God. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> I thought you guys would rescue me there. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of Christ, my Savior. Standing, standing, I am standing on the promises of God. Stand and keep standing. Well, the second thing, looking at that passage was, when Abraham was standing and he saw the smoke going up, what do you think he thought? My nephew is gone. What do you think he thought about God? God didn't answer me. God forsook me. God is harsh. So all I stood talking to him yesterday, was it a waste of time? Why did I even bother to pray if God will still go ahead and do this? Mm. Perspective. We only see in part. We do not see the full picture. But one scripture that I hold on to, Numbers 23 verse 19. Numbers 23, verse 19. It says, God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. No, I'm just trying to, to, to quote it. Yes, yes. Just a minute. Right. You? I was just thinking, Daniel, even when he was... Uh asked to do all these things and renounce his faith. He said, even if God doesn't answer our prayers, I'll still follow him. I will still trust. I'll still be there. I will still he trust. He never does nothing when you pray. Oh, I love that. <laughs> I it love that. It might not always be what you expect, but he'll always do something. Please oh, yes. say it again. <laughs> Which bit? He never... <laughs> uh, he, <laughs> <laughs> he never does nothing when you pray, um, even if it's only to give you peace about a situation. He always answers it somehow. Andrew will say, the biggest but in the Bible. Yeah. But even if you don't answer, I will continue to serve. I also trust you. I have no alternative. Yeah. I lose nothing trusting God. <laughs> ah. Sorry. Job, Job said, though he slay me, I will yet praise him. I see Habakkuk that says, though the bands be empty, Habakkuk 3, I will still trust in the Lord. Even mm -hmm. if he hasn't given me what I'm asking for, I will still trust him. And do you know, <laughs> it's about perspective. When you pray, sometimes you think he hasn't answered based on what you are seeing. 
Abraham saw smoke. He didn't see the fact that his brother or his nephew had been rescued. And do you know, his nephew did not know that Abraham was praying. Sometimes we are praying for people who have no clue that we are praying for them. We are praying for Harich. Harich doesn't know that we are praying for them. Your family members don't know we are praying for them. Boris Johnson doesn't know we are praying for him. You don't have to ask permission to do it either. No. Hallelujah. You just pray. But Hallelujah. let them reap the benefits. Let them reap the blessing. That's all we care about. It's not about making a name no, for sir. ourselves. It's about the kingdom of God, the purpose of God being accomplished, and people being blessed, yes. having a better life. Yes, uh, the Morrison then. Um, Jeremiah 33, all the threes. 33, verse 3. Jeremiah 33, verse 3. All the threes. Three threes. Amen. That cannot be broken. 33-3. <laughs> the phone call. And I would answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. Amen. As the pastor says, when we wait upon him, he reveals things we are unaware of. Amen. He teaches us and to be taught of God, what a wonderful experience. Spirit of God, thou teach of thee, revealing the things of Christ to me. Amen. 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 Um, when the three men came to visit Abraham, I don't know how his, the members of his household felt because he had slaves. He had more than 300 people in his household. Now, when he went back the next day and he saw what God had done, I watched the movie and I realized that it's not everything that um, um, Sarah, God was doing in Abraham's life yeah, Sarah knew. that Sarah knew or understood. In the same way, his household were also looking up to him. The fact that God came and he spoke to him and he saw the smoke is a testimony to his whole household that Abraham had encountered God. So if they did not believe in him or his mission, because that mission, sometimes it didn't look right because of <laughs> the bumpy rides they were having on the way. That was a time for the people to know that this man actually is a friend of God. May God give us credibility. Because sometimes people will criticize people who pray. And they say to you, why, why bother? Why, why waste your time? Why, why, why? But rather than join them in doubting God, when you doubt God, you get nothing. Stand in faith and watch God show up. Hallelujah. I don't need to have all the answers, but I stand in faith. I stand looking to God. And I know he will come through on my behalf. He never does nothing. I love that. <laughs> yes, sir. Abraham, but what calls to my mind is Abraham first was, uh, he wasn't obedient. God had promised Sarah and Abraham a baby. But they wanted it to happen in their time. So he went and got Hagar. They bore a son. But that was not the son that God promised them. But God didn't get mad. Didn't Hallelujah. cast him out. <laughs> Hallelujah. Okay? At the proper time, they got the baby that God had promised them. And that was the child. So when things don't happen in our time, you got to be patient. Trust God. Continue to be focused with God. And God would give us what God knows that we need when it's time for us to get it. Amen. The young man said, just ask. Ask comes before receiving, mommy. Let's just be asking. Learn to ask. And then wait. There's so many things that we can, well, not we, maybe pastor, can take and expand. 
<laughs> out of all the things we have said tonight, so many things. And I'm asking myself, should we continue? Should we stay and true? Should we continue? But I'm praying that God will help us to run. There are so many things that we have dropped here tonight. God is a God of remembrance. God is a God of mercy. God is a God of grace. God is a God of second chances. God is a God who wants to be known. God is a God of, of faith. He's a God of honor. You see, you've, you've said so many things. Our brother has just reminded us that even though Abraham and Sarah went their own way, God did not cast them away. He still remained with them and still honored his promise to them. Prakasanda, I don't know who I'm speaking to tonight. Maybe you have done something you should not have done because you got impatient with God. I want to say to you tonight that God is still merciful. I want to say to you tonight, don't write yourself off. Don't cast yourself off. God is a redeemer. That's his name. He knows how to redeem you from the mistakes of life. He knows how to take the errors and the nonsenses and still make room for his grace, for his beauty, and for his plan. Nothing, nothing stops God from being God. I want to say to you tonight, there is mercy for you. There is hope for you. And you will still carry your promise as God made to you. He will still honor his word in your life. Amen? Engage God. Yeah, we, we sing this song. Um, Covenant keeping God. There is no one like you. Alpha and Omega. There is no one like you. Covenant keeping God, there is no one like you. The Alpha and Omega, there is no one like you. In other words, if God has made that promise to you, it is not dependent on you. Long after we, we are gone, God will still keep his covenant. When he told the children of Israel, he told Abraham actually, I'll bring your children back into this land, the land on which you are standing. 430 years later, he brought them back. When you engage with God, remember that he is a covenant keeper. He keeps covenant. He keeps promises. He, he, he wouldn't disappoint you and say, well, uh, I didn't know that the Bank of England was going to raise their interest rate. If I had taken that into consideration, I wouldn't have made the promise that I would look after you. No, 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 no. He, 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 he makes promises based on his ability and capability. He's omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient. The God we are talking about is the God who can bring life to dead situations. Hallelujah. And if he says, I will do it, he, Romans 8, 28, he says, and God will cause all things to work together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. So my job is to love him and believe him, trust him. How he will make it happen, I don't know. Sometimes I have no clue. And that's the limitation of my human mind. Sometimes I, I, as a researcher, I want to know how the, the exact mechanisms by which it will happen. And he says, your job is to trust me. How it will happen, leave to me. It's not your business. Yes, sir. Oh, sorry, okay, um, pulling that uh, Jeremiah 33 3 up, when I read that, it made me think earlier, what, four chapters earlier in Jeremiah 29 11, when he tells us he's got a plan for us. Mm. There he tells us, don't worry, you don't know what the plan <laughs> is. He's going to tell you later. I know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I like this scripture, uh, and sometimes when I read it, the way I read it is, 
and we know that all things existing and not existing. Mm. <laughs> so it may already seen exist. and unseen. Mm. Seen and unseen. <laughs> so if God has to create it to create. work together for my good, he will create it. It may never have been done for anybody before. Mine will be the first case. Oh, yes. I may never, you may never see the whole family knowing God before. Mine will be. Mm. It may not have been seen before. He said, and we know, all, all includes all. seen <laughs> and, unseen. and unseen. Created and not created yet. Because he's a creator. We were read, I was reading yesterday uh, where they were talking about um, the galaxies and, and how, how big galaxies are. It's as if when God, uh, in, in the Bible, there's, it's just a throwaway line. It says, and he created the stars. <laughs> you know, and he created the stars. The stars are still being created, even now as we speak. An ever expanding. It is ever, ever expanding. So creating things for our sakes is no big deal for God. There's a scripture someone quoted this evening. It says, when a man's ways please the Lord. Please find that for, I think, Proverbs 16 or 7. When a man's ways please the Lord... He makes, and, and I pause there, he makes. He makes even his enemies to be at peace with him, but the thing is, he makes. When our ways, when we engage God, God makes. God, God makes the situation happen. God makes the things align. God makes the impossible possible. When God is engaged, he goes to work based on his ability, not ours. He is not God is not depending on me for him to fulfill his promises. I can't help God. Sometimes we feel, oh... Let me not ask for that because it might be too big for God. No, no, no. I can't help God. Let, when I ask, my job is to ask him. His job is to answer. I don't know how he will answer it, but it's up to him. When a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even, even to the extent that those negative, ultra negative situations can become favorable <laughs> situations. Lazarus has been dead four days. Even that wasn't a problem. He said Lazarus. He just said it like a statement. Lazarus, come forth. And the dead man came back to life. Four days. Stinking situations. I don't know what stinking situation you are going through. Or disgraceful situation. Or troubles you are going through. But God will give you double for your trouble. Amen. He will bring... He, he will wipe away your tears. He will wipe away your reproach. Says he makes even his enemies to be at peace with. And that takes us back to the original scripture. God wants us to be at peace. He wants us to be at peace. Peace with him. Peace with ourselves. And peace with others. So the goal of our prayer should always be peace. Amen. Lord, give me peace. Give me peace rest and do the same for those around me and those I know and those who don't know me. What a God we serve, don't you think? An amazing God. Um, I just want to take something Uncle said. He said, even if he has more for others, mine will be the first. Scripture is full of firsts. Where did somebody ever touch the hem of the Lord's garment to get well before the woman with the issue of blood showed up? Where was a 40-year-old blind man, born blind? Where was there ever a record that such a man saw before God opened the eyes of that man? Don't limit God. The fact that you have not heard and read doesn't mean God cannot do. 
John writing in 1 John said, F, is it 1 John or the last, the last chapter of John, John itself? John, John, the last, John 22 or so. He said, 21. He said, everything Jesus did, we can't put it in the book. So what you know is just a fraction. I was saying to my children, I'm glad I did chemistry when I did chemistry. Because between then and now, the periodic table yes. has increased. <laughs> elements. More elements, yeah. <laughs> elements have come in from, I could barely cram and memorize and remember the periodic table during my day. How on earth will I remember it with all day? Sometimes we sit down and we watch Osman's house. And he asks some very interesting questions. Or is it pointless? And they ask pointless. And then you, you begin to think. And some of the elements is it that they come out from. And you say, this does not exist. And they tell you, yes, it was only found. People, what am I saying? There are many things I don't know. There are many things you don't know. But let's not use our ignorance to limit God. God, you are still God. You are still a creator. You are still all-powerful. You haven't changed your story when you said, call to me. So, Lord, this is the situation. I have no one else that can do it except you. So, I am bringing this to you. Over to you. Hand it over and go. That's what, that's what engaging God is all about. It's not, but it has never happened before. And Smith Wiggles was sorry, went to pray for somebody. Or was called to come and said, my wife is dying, please just. So he carries his fellow Christian brother, who is a good prayer warrior. He says, let's go together. Let's go and pray for this uh, gentleman whose wife is about to die. And so they walk into the room. And the prayer, the prayer warrior starts praying, God, give the man strength to cope. Help him to know how to look after his children. Yes, and he, who all shouted, Lord Jesus, silence him. We came to pray for the healing. We didn't come to pray for burial. When people call on you to pray, there is a reason why they have called you. When you show up, what do you pray? Comfortable prayer, as sister said. Easy prayer, no stress prayer. Just in case God doesn't answer me. Why don't you pray just in case God answers me prayers? That, those are better prayers to answer. Those are better prayers to pray. He said, God silenced him. God silenced him. He said to the, the husband, Umba, join me. That one was no better. He said, God send him out of here. He went to the woman and said, in Jesus' name, get up now. Poured anointing oil on her and she got up. Scripture says, you shall call for the elders. They shall anoint you with oil and the prayer of faith. Not the prayer of fear, the prayer of doubt, and the prayer of comfort. You know, Elder Morris prayed for me before I went on, <coughs> excuse me, this last trip. Um, Lord, bring people his way that <laughs> he may minister the grace of God to them, something, words to that effect. And this has been the busiest trip I've had. <laughs> <laughs> it has been the busiest trip I have had. And it just seemed as if all the situations that were coming before me were impossible situations. Mostly couples. You know, husband, wife, and just each person, oh, whoa. And it just lacks very diverse, deep troubles. And it wasn't like, oh, they, they had a headache or, <laughs> or something. Deep, deep situations. And I said, okay, now what, what would I do? What, what kind of prayer would I pray? I said, well, it's not up to me to answer the prayers. My job is to pray. And they, they came to me not because I'm their friend, but because they called me pastor. So I said, okay, God, these people, it's not because of me. So I had courage. I said, Lord, in the name of Jesus, I stand under the authority and prayed for different things. Every day, it was like that. Different situations I was encountering. And you know, it wasn't more difficult to pray for those situations than to pray for a headache. 
if you can exercise faith at all, why not exercise faith for what you consider difficult rather than just for the simple things? The faith is the same faith. So it's the same hand of God that you would move to heal the headache that you also move to heal cancer. It's the same finger of God. So why not engage God? If there were things that you could do by yourself, then maybe you don't need to pray, but I pray for everything all the same. But if it's something that requires God, then ask God for the big things. Everything requires God. Uh, there's a song we sing. Okay. Elder Morris, after you. Is anything too hard for God? You are God alone. From before time began, you were on your throne. You were God alone. And right now, in the, the good, good times, times and bad, you were on your throne. You were God alone. You can change the key. <laughs> you are God alone mm, from before time began. You are on your throne. You are God alone. And right now, in the good times and bad, you are on your throne. You were God alone. You were unchangeable. Unchangeable. Unshakable. Unshakable. Unstoppable. And that's, that's who, who you are. You were unchangeable. Unchangeable. Unshakable. Unshakable. Unstoppable. That's who you are. You are God alone. From before time began. Could we please stand? You were on your throne. You were God alone. And right now, right now in the good times and bad, Lord, you were on your throne. Lord, you were God alone. Just reach your, your hands to God. Daddy, I am here for you. I have come because he said I should come. Daddy, I reach out my hand to take a hold of yours. This is how I know to engage you. You know my heart. You know my desire. You know the challenges I see around me at work, at home, on my street, my nation, every day. Unchangeable, unshakable, unstoppable God. I invite you into these situations. Lord, deliver the righteous. Lord, send laborers to the, to the world of the wicked. My father, let the reaper angels go to walk among my family members, amongst my neighborhood. Begin to reap souls for your kingdom. Why should they die around me? Ah, precious father. If you are God, bid me come. Let me begin to walk in the supernatural. Let me begin to touch, to see, to taste the invisible. Ah, my daddy, bid me come. That when I pray for the sick, they recover. When I pray for the hungry, they are fed. Amen. Let my five loaves and two fish begin to feed the multitude. Amen. If you are God, daddy, I engage with you tonight. Bid me come. It is not in you to destroy the righteous with the wicked. Daddy, see my place of work, see my school. See how the righteous are being made to suffer for the sins of the wicked. Daddy, step in and deliver those called by your name. 
Oh, precious Father, it gives you no pleasure that the wicked perish. Daddy, the grace to turn, to turn, and to turn from their evil ways. I draw on their behalf tonight. Ah, God of encounter, God of deliverance, God of salvation, God of now. Let my family members turn from their wicked ways. Let all of my household be saved. Those I know and those I don't know. Bring them to repentance. Bring them to salvation. Amen. God, we engage you for the church. Set the church on fire. Restore the grace of the Holy Spirit to your church. Restore faith to the house of faith. Ah, my daddy, we engage you for the body of Christ. Let us run again with the fire of God. Daddy, for our nation, for our prime minister, for the royal family, we engage you, God of mercy. God, show us mercy. Amen. We need help. We have not walked this way before. There is no book to go and read and see what to do when you get to this point. But there is God. Of all wisdom, of all knowledge, of all understanding. God, we engage you for our nation. Show us which way to go. What they say we cannot come out of, bring us out of. What they say cannot be done, do it for us. Heal our land, Daddy. Help our leaders. Take the glory. For we worship and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Lord, please bless us and keep us. Jehovah, please make your face shine upon us and be gracious unto us. Give us the power to pray. Give us the faith to trust you. Lift up the light of your countenance upon us. Fill our bands with testimonies of answers to prayer. I pray that each one of us will engage with you and our names will be written in your book of remembrance of those who feared the Lord and who trusted in him and spoke often of him and meditated on his ways. And with that, grant us your peace. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's share the grace together. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, evermore. Amen. God bless you. We meet again tomorrow for prayer meeting at 7.30 and on Sunday at 10.15 for Bible study and family worship. God bless you. Thank you for coming. Good night. Praise his name. Praise his name. Well, I'd like to thank everybody here tonight. Thank